and welcome to a webinar that we are calling Cybersecurity Protections in an Expanding Digital Environment. Just want to make sure that we're, we're recording here, Jeanette. Yes, we are. Okay, great. This is part of an ongoing cybersecurity webinar series that we are putting together with the New York Conference of Mayors, the Association of Towns, and the New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal. As governments and public leaders move to modernize how they engage with citizens, more and more services have a digital connection. These range from citizen facing services such as 911 emergency services to websites for imparting information or scheduling services and using connections with a physical component such as a public water and or electrical meters. More and more essential government services such as traffic lights and public utilities are examples of operational technology that are increasingly vulnerable to cyber threats. Keeping those types of public services available and our citizens safe is top of mind for leaders across the state, county, and local governments. Before we begin today, we have a few how brief housekeeping announcements. I'd like to introduce Jeanette Stanziano, the NISAC Director of Education and Training. Jeanette. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just two really quick announcements. Mm -hmm. We are recording this program as we do with all of our webinars. And you can find a recording of this session, as well as a PDF version of the slide deck on our website about an hour after the program. If you just go to the NISAC website, go under webinar and just look for today's date. You can also find the recording on NISAC's YouTube channel, NISAC TV. We want to encourage you to feel free to submit questions in writing during the program. I have to tell you that I see a different dashboard this time. So we do ask people to submit their questions through your dashboard. Used to be submitted through the questions tab, but um, I'll have to say that I hope you have a tab like that. <laughs> and if you do, please feel free to submit questions in writing. We will get to the questions at the end of the program through a monitored brief Q&A. Back to you, Mark. We are honored to have our speaker today. He's a, a rock star in the world of government cybersecurity. Jim Richberg is Fortinet's head of cyber policy and global field CISO. He leverages nearly 40 years experience driving innovation in cybersecurity and threat intelligence. Prior to joining Fortinet, Jim served as the U.S. National Intelligence Manager for Cyber which is the senior federal executive focused on cyber intelligence with the, within the 80 billion 100 employee US intelligence community. He led the creation and implementation of cyber strategy for the 17 departments and agencies of the intelligence community, set integrated priorities on cyber threat and served as the senior advisor to the director of national intelligence on cyber issues. He brings a broad enterprise level approach to cybersecurity, honed as a member of the executive team that oversaw implementation of a whole of government US comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative for two different presidents. We are honored to, today to have Jim Richburg with us today. Jim, I'd like to turn the, the uh, presentation over to you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you, Mark. First, uh, just an audio check, confirm that everybody can hear me. I, can You can hear me, right, Mark? Confirmed, yes. Okay, we are good to go. So, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, as you can tell from what Mark said, uh, I have a foot in both camps. And you know, I have extensive experience doing cybersecurity in government, and now here I am at, at one of the world's largest cybersecurity companies. So I, I, I see the problem and I see the solution from both sides. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I testified to uh, House of Representatives Committee uh, to 
two and a half weeks ago. Uh, used to do a lot of testimony in government. Uh, I had a hiatus after I retired. Now I'm back. Um, we had three hours. We have less than an hour for this, but but what we were doing in that house hearing was a primer on some of the, the key trends and, and topics and areas that government officials needed to focus on. That was at the federal level. Um, I'm gonna give you a taste of what uh, I covered with them. I recognize that people watching this webinar come from a variety of backgrounds, some more technical than others. I'm gonna try to, find the happy medium, not gonna go deep on anything. Uh, we're gonna cover a lot of material, but uh, I, to reiterate what Mark and Jeanette have said, I really, really encourage questions. I want this to be interactive. So I will reserve time at the end as questions uh, occur to you or things you want me to dive into as we go along. Please, please type them in as questions and we'll get to them. Uh, these are the things I'm gonna cover in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to hit some of the highlights of the IT landscape and more importantly, what they mean for cybersecurity. I'm going to hit some of the key concepts, call them buzzwords if you want, in cybersecurity. I'm going to talk about cyber threat as a big issue, not going to talk about 10 threats of the week, and cyber threat intelligence. My career was in the intelligence community, so I'm a big believer that you can't protect yourself against a threat that you don't understand and therefore aren't going to be able to detect. And because I'm all about making something actionable, I'm going to give you some recommendations on ways to think about the problem, the kind of resources that I think you can leverage effectively. Uh, next slide, please. Let's dive into some of these key trends in the landscape. The first is, what are the big differences between information technology, IT, and operational technology, OT? Um, IT, of course, is about data processing, data storage, data transmission. We are using IT to conduct this webinar. You use IT every time you use email, every time you use something as a service, like uh, you know word processing, where the data and the software are no longer on your device, they're stored someplace else. Um, IT tends to be upgraded a lot, and because it's about data, data security is very important. OT, on the other hand, operational technology, is how you monitor and control physical services, the world around you. Uh, security is not as important because operational technology is fundamentally about safety, first and foremost, and then it's about reliability. And you wouldn't want security to be more important than not harming or killing people using the technology or ensuring that it was consistently available. So security rightfully is going to come in as less important. And whereas we update IT frequently, um, two to three years is when a lot of people swap out their phones. Operational technology tends to be deployed for 20 to 30 years. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And again, a lot of these are in regulated industries that don't have the luxury of saying, oh, I want to recapitalize and swap everything out. So OT tends to be around for a long time. OT tends not to be updated as frequently. Uh, and now we talk about the Internet of Things. You're all familiar with ring doorbells, Nest thermostats, your refrigerator and your washing machine may be on the internet and may tell you when the load is done or when you need fresh milk. You're starting to see the OT equivalent of that with the industrial internet of things. This matters from a security perspective because many of these devices are not upgradable and they may have default security passwords like 123456 or admin or even worse, password. It's hard in many cases to know what the security level of one of these devices is. And therefore you have the Federal Communications Commission that is launching something called the Cyber Trust Mark that hopefully will become something like the Energy Star label as a way of looking at these IoT and industrial IoT devices and saying, oh look, this one is at this end of the spectrum on security. Uh, but otherwise, many of these devices start to bring risk. Uh, cloud, it's not news to anyone that we've moved from an era where every organization had their own data in a government data center to something where in some cases you may be using a fully publicly offered like AWS or Google or one of the other big companies data center. 
um, you're using cloud storage, you're using cloud-based services, that starts to relate to what we call X as a service, which normally means things like software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. With all of these cloud offerings, security is not solely the responsibility of the organization that's providing you the platform and providing you the service. At a minimum, you, the user, the user organization, have responsibility for how you configure the, day, the, the application and how you provide the security. So again, this is a different model for security as well as for the provision of services. Uh, we're increasingly in an era of software-defined networking. We are a decade beyond saying everything that's on my network is a workstation. It is something that's literally physically wired into my network. Increasingly, devices can join a network, get a certain class of privileges, do something, and then drop off the network. Your phone does it. Um, all of those IoT devices can be part of that. So the network itself is not static. It is a fungible, fluid type of activity. Um, we certainly saw the rise of Connect From Anywhere when the pandemic hit us. And we, we all went from working in office to working largely, if not exclusively, remotely. The new paradigm became connect from anywhere. So now the focus was on enabling the connection of devices, users, because sometimes users and devices can be different things, data, and the compute resource, resources to do something about it, regardless of where any of those four elements was located. And we're starting to see the rise of edge computing, all of that IoT. We used to talk about you connected from the edge and then you did the work back in the cloud and then you sent the results back out. Well, now a lot of the activity is actually happening at the edge. And the results may be reported into the core, they may be reported to other edge devices, but no longer are we saying it flows only one way or two ways. It may flow in all directions at once. And increasingly, we have edge security as well. You may hear a term sassy, which is not what your teenager's attitude is when you ask them to clean their room, but rather it's the acronym for something we call Secure Access Service Edge, cloud-provided security to end devices. So these are some of the big IT trends and some of the cybersecurity dimensions. Next slide, please, Jeanette. Uh, there are some more that I want to cover. AI and machine learning. Now, clearly, this has been heavily hyped over the last year, year and a half. But the reality is AI and machine learning are not new. They're 70 years old as a commercial practice. Um, and AI and machine learning have, in fact, fundamentally transformed our capabilities in cybersecurity over the past decade or so. Uh, you know, you look at a company like the one I work for, and we can see several hundred billion, with a B, pieces of potentially su suspicious security activity every day that we have to make sense of in our customers' networks and help them defend against. We don't have enough employees at Fortinet. There are not enough human beings on earth to go through that kind of data manually. So we and our peers in the industry have actually become very sophisticated in our use of AI and ML, machine learning, make massive neural networks. In some cases, we've literally created uh, separate languages, computer ways of taking the data from different kinds of sensors, normalizing it, and allowing us to compare apples to apples. Um, automation and autonomy. You've seen this happen in the public sector, certainly with COVID, when you send everybody home at the same time that the demand for government services like unemployment insurance spiked by, by uh, you know, 3,000 percent. You needed things like robotic process automation, the ability to automate what humans knew how to do manually. In some cases, it could turn processes that took a human being doing manual entry Hit going to multiple databases, reconciling things. You take that from hours to minutes. Uh, we're now starting to use intelligent automation, allow limited um, machine learning to say, OK, typically when these three things occur, this should occur as well. Something is missing, or if they're consuming this kind of service, let me suggest this one because they're often correlated. So it's limited. It, it, it's limited uses of AI, as opposed to robotic process automation, which is I'm going to automate what a human being already does, 
and simply letting the machine do something instead of a human being. Generative AI. Generative AI, of course, has been driving all of the hype right now. And uh, I, I assume everyone has played around with generative AI, at least at home. Um, you're probably getting prompts in your emails, your word processor, suggesting, you know, different spellings, suggesting different endings. Uh, this is this is something where I think as people start to use generative AI, they they realize that what they put into the prompt for this generative AI is in fact becoming training data. And depending on how they're, what kind of, of uh, structure they're using, it is exposed for other people to recover. Um, it's a good news, bad news story because the people who make these large language models and run them, the people who make the third party applications recognize the need for security guardrails to safeguard your data and your privacy. Um, so the good news is those tend to exist. The bad news is you have to ask for them. It's the wild west in the sense of there are smart ways to do things and secure things. The bad news is they're not yet default practices. So you as a consumer of these services need to be able to specify, I want to use this large public model, but I want to use it in a private data lake, or I'm willing to make my queries be part of the public lake, but I want a data retention policy that says they expire in X amount of time. You can find secure ways to do it. You have to have this kind of dialogue with the organization that's providing you these kind of capabilities. I put this final set of bullets in because one of the, the challenges I find with organizations is they are using these large language model generative AI tools in instances that are really not appropriate. And the three rules of thumb that I've, I've come to um, after conversations with some of the data scientists who make and, and run these things are the, the three things there at the bottom. Don't, you, don't use it when you absolutely positively need perfection. You know, if, it, if 90 plus percent accuracy is good enough, that's good. But if I have to be perfect, don't use it. If you need instant results. Uh, now, yes, we type things into these uh, prompts and we get something back in seconds. And that's good enough for coming up with an idea for a speech, for, you know, helping me, uh, you know, even write an email for me. Is that good enough to steer, to land a plane, to control my power plant with? No. Probably not. And the third point relates to this whole issue of transparency. You may have heard the term data hallucination, where it just gives you something ludicrous. If a human being can't judge bad or good out from good outcome, that's not a good use case. Doesn't mean the human has to be able to reproduce that outcome, but you look at a piece of art and go, okay, the human being has 11 fingers. Uh, you know, I can tell good from bad. So these are some of the the uh, the rubric criteria that I find are smart to keep in mind for when to use it and when not to use it. Next slide, please. Now I want to touch on some of the, uh, the the buzzwords, the hot terms that you often hear tossed around relating to cybersecurity. Um, and one of those is the term attack surface, which is the intersection of all of those IT trends that I talked about with cybersecurity. But it's really often shorthand for size and complexity. Uh, you know, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld used to talk about uh, the known unknowns, factors we knew even if we couldn't quantify them, but what he really worried about was the unknown unknowns, the things we simply weren't even aware of that were going to turn around and bite us. And in this case, the fact that we've talked about all the devices that can connect, all the ways that machines are increasingly able to use AI and ML. The fact that you don't know what you don't know and how in the world do you defend this. I'm not a real fan of the term attack surface because as somebody who in his government career had guns pointed at him, has been shot, I like to avoid being attacked. All of the things I've described so far are not things I want to avoid. That is our reality. That is the transformation that's enabling us to do things in government service that we couldn't do a number of years ago. It brings risk. It's a digital surface. It brings risk that we need to manage. And I talked a little bit about how AI and ML has helped uh, cybersecurity industry. Size and complexity is actually our friend uh, because what makes artificial intelligence and machine learning work? Data, more specifically, big data. And as a general rule, 
who is in a better position to know how a network is set up, how it's being administered, and how it's being defended? The people who are doing that or the people who are trying to break into it as a black box from the outside? Yeah, sure, there are niches like the content for spear phishing, for emails that you're going to try to do someone with where AI and ML help the attacker more than the defender. But on balance, this size and complexity is something that should rebound in favor of us, the people playing defense, the people setting this stuff up rather than the people attacking. Another term you hear tossed around that's related to attack surface and the fact that you don't know what you don't know is shadow IT. Our users are really creative. Um, they will get ahead of us if they feel we in government are innovating too slowly. We used to see this back in the days of when personal computers were a novelty. Local organizations will go out and buy their own. And there's a, it, it, how do you defend your organization when you have IT assets that you don't even know about? You can't defend what you're not even aware is, is part of your infrastructure. Uh, and we're starting to see that, I think, increasingly with generative AI, where people are starting to get ahead of the organization in the way they're using that kind of tool. To me, that's the latest instantiation of, of, Geneva, of shadow IT to worry about. Zero trust. Zero trust is a terrible name for something that is common sense and in many cases a set of practices we've been doing for a long time. And I find zero trust a particularly off-putting term in the public sector where you have people who are public servants who may be making a financial sacrifice to be doing things for the common good, for the general public, and then to be told we have zero trust in you and here's how we're doing this. But zero trust really mean things like, look, we segment our networks and you all have segmented networks. The people who are logging on to look at building permits, even if they're government employees, probably can't go to the part of your government that if you provide local water service, does that, or tax records. So you already have the network broken up into different enclaves. Lease privilege. People can log on and they can look at property tax records. Unless they're a certain class of user, they can't go in and set that property valuation. So you give people, if they only need to read data, why would I give them the, the, the privilege to write data or even worse, delete the file? Give them the minimum they need to get that particular task done and role-based access control. You give the public one set of permissions. You give your contractors another set of permissions. You give your government employees a third set of privileges. But underpinning zero trust is assume the network is compromised and, and behave accordingly. Don't, oh, don't, you know, act as if bad, bad guys and bad activity are happening. Minimize the consequences of anything bad happening. So zero trust is really uh, about, it's, it's a, a pejorative label for something that is common sense and good practices. Uh, next slide, please. Now I want to make the pivot to talking about cyber threat. And uh, Jeanette, can we, can we spool to the next slide? Sorry, working on this. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, I saw, I saw things flip. But let me go ahead and, and keep talking about that. So, you know, when I talk about threat, I'm not going to talk about specific little ones. But, you know, I, I spent 20 years at the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And when I talk about threats, I talk about the other CIA, which is we worry about threats to the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of our data. In other words, somebody steals my data or particularly with operational technology, they go in and change the contents so that it actually can cause something to happen, or they deny me the ability to get to the data or the data provided service, uh, de denial of service. Ransomware is typically the top of mind activity for people in state and local government. Initially, ransomware was about availability. They came in and encrypted your data and were extorting you for it. We increasingly see ransomware that not only makes your data unavailable, they may steal your data. They may threaten to expose citizen data or sell your data on the dark web. They may come in and wipe it out. You know, ransomware may no longer be something that encrypts it. They may say, if you don't pay me the ransom, I'm literally going to destroy your data in place. Uh, so those are the kinds of threats that we need to uh, we need to worry about. Uh, we've actually got a slightly different version of the slides up than, than I thought we were working from. Insider threat. Insider threat 
um, is is a term that I, I I don't like as well as I like the term insider risk because I think the biggest mis the the biggest threat to an organization is not people acting with malice. It's people making mistakes. Yes, sure, there are bad apples in every bushel of an appreciable size. So, size. so if you are a large organization, you almost certainly do have people who are, whether disgruntled, whether acting from another motive, setting out to do things. But on balance, I'm going to bet that you suffer more damage from people trying to do the right thing or not knowing better, or in some cases not being given secure ways to do them, who are making mistakes. So that's the bigger problem that I think you, you need to focus on. Uh, when we talk about why threat actors operate, there really are three classes of threat actor. Uh, you've got hackers who are doing something, whether for bragging rights or sometimes for political motivation. Every time there's a geopolitical conflict, you see people we call hacktivists who are doing something in the name of ideology. The actors who are acting to make money are criminals. Criminals won't do something unless there's a payoff involved in it. Um, and they are very opportunistic. Hackers may be doing it for money. Hacktivists are almost certainly doing it to make a point. Um, with what's going on in the Middle East right now, um, I would look to see an uptick of that kind of activity. I suspect many of your organizations have already seen, uh, seen this done in the name of ideology. But the, the group that really is not motivated by making money are the advanced persistent threat actors who are usually nation states. Uh, these are people who can play the long game. Uh, they tend to have people who did the work I did in government, who um, became genuine cyber experts, who could develop the, te the, the technology, who in many cases could say, I can have a human being on the inside to help me bypass the machine as a way to do this. Uh, so the advanced persistent threats are something that, because it's nation state affiliated, uh, it's it's disproportionately targeted against you in the public sector. And so you're in the position of having to worry both about criminals, some of whom are very opportunistic. They want to make money. They want to make money the easiest way possible. They may not be targeting you because of who you are. They may be targeting you because you are an easy mark and you're likely to be able to pay for it. When it comes to the nation state advanced persistent threat target, uh, sometimes you get targeted intentionally. Both Russia and China have a doctrine that says if they are if they are in a confrontation with the United States, they're going to attack our critical infrastructure to distract us. Uh, you know, if decision makers are worried about dealing with bad things happening in critical infrastructure in state and local government, not only does it make it hard to move troops and do things that would be directly related to the response, but there's going to be a lot of time and attention focused on mitigating those consequences instead of dealing with the geopolitical uh, consequence uh, issue of the day. Uh, and sometimes you literally get caught in the crossfire. People go, well, why should I have to worry about what's happening in Ukraine? Um, I saw this a dozen years ago where um, one of the big nation state adversaries uh, that was trying to penetrate the oil and gas industry ended up in building elevators across the country because it turns out that the same uh, uh, computer chips controllers that work in pump stations also work in elevators. So sometimes they don't even intend to get there, but all of a sudden you find I've got nation state activity in my network. So those are some of the cyber threats that I worry about. Um, next slide, please. Jim, I just want to uh, double check and make sure we're on the same, you're seeing the same slides. So I am now seeing cyber threat intelligence. Awesome. Great. Thank you. You know, uh, cyber threat intelligence is not a one size fits all thing. We toss that around like it's a, a, a monolithic thing, but the reality is there are three different types and levels of cyber threat intelligence. There's the tactical stuff that's produced by machines that's used by machines. In many cases, it's binary. It's ones and zeros. It doesn't even really make sense to human beings. But that's the overwhelming majority of what we see. Computers, sensors pick it up. Sensors uh, may make sense of it. Sensors may send it to other devices to act on. Um, and that can come, that can be different kinds of things. So you may be able to compare apples to oranges by normalizing it and allowing the machines or people to be able to connect the dots. 
of it, you turn raw data into dots. You then connect the dots to say, oh, look, some of this activity looks alike or it's occurring together. It's a playbook. It's a playbook of what the adversary is doing. Uh, and that's something where the human being may, may or may not produce it, but the human being consumes it. It's the human beings who say, oh, look, here's how this threat actor, whether they're nation straight or criminal behaves, here's the kind of plays they run, which definitely affects the kind of plays I need to run as the defenders. And once in a blue moon, you get strategic intelligence that says, heads up, I need to change my patterns. Some of you watching this webinar may have been recipients of a briefing in 2022 by the federal government as part of the Shields Up initiative. When things kicked off in Ukraine, we had credible information that if we levied sanctions on Russia, that Putin was going to direct the Russian intelligence services to do destructive things against our financial sector. So that meant we literally we were advised by the federal government make changes that you can't sustain for the long term because we have credible threat information. The reality is you can't do all of this yourself. The tactical information is being provided to your devices on an automated basis, but even this operational information. Look, I ran this for the intelligence community. The biggest three letter agencies in the federal government can't do this alone. They partner between themselves. They partner with the private sector. You're going to need this as a service. You're going to need this as partnership. It's important, but don't try to do everything yourself. Next slide, please. I think we're, we're pivoting now to the recommendations. I've talked a little bit about the environment. Next slide, please. And now I really want to leave you with the, what do you do about all this stuff? Cybersecurity is a process. There are, sir, there are products and services that you can buy, but this is not a one and done thing. Uh, you're going to have to view this as a journey uh, rather than a destination that you're ever going to get to. You're never going to get perfect security. You're really going to have to manage risk. And there's been a lot of good thinking done about what best practices and standards look like. Um, and the first one I would point you to would be the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST's cybersecurity framework. I helped build the first version of this back in 2014. It was intended as a scorecard for what we were doing in the federal government. Little did we suspect that this was going to be something that the rest, that other parts of the public sector, and even more so the private sector, were going to say, yeah, this makes sense. So when you're thinking about how do I manage cyber risk? The first thing you got to do is identify what you care about. What are the crown jewel assets and, oper and activities for my organization? How do I protect those? Once I put those protections in place, how do I detect that threat activity is occurring against them? And again, how do I respond to those? And assuming that the threat activity is unfortunately successful, how do I recover from that threat? So, I'm surprised people around the world can say identify, detect, protect, detect, respond, recover. And because all of this needs central orchestration, people are, are you have players in your organization doing these. You need a coach. You need an owner of the program. Uh, there's major revision being done to the NIST cybersecurity framework to add governance as a separate function that in fact touches all of these. Someone in government, you, people you work with, should be running this as a centralized process, figuring out how you need to do these five things. So that's that's uh, my advice on thinking about cybersecurity. It's a really about a risk management paradigm rather than saying, I can do this, I, I, I funded this, wash my hands of it, it's done, it's an automatic pilot. The assets you have change, the activities you have change. So governance, by people at your level is going to become increasingly important in this. Next slide, please. Training is critically important. Training at various levels, training for various levels of consumers. You got to train your users about things like spear phishing and basic cyber hygiene. What do they do? What should they look for as activities? What should they avoid? Who should they report a bad thing to? I've talked about generative AI. I think most people in organizations and government recognize the kinds of data about citizens and services that they don't want to expose. So part of user training should be, look, here's what we're doing in the organization to bring generative AI into the organization in a thoughtful, moderated way. If you freelance, if you start using your cell phone to do things, 
there's a one in 10 chance, 10 chance with any query you do, you may be exposing citizen data, you may be exposing internal data. Teaching and education are very, very important. Making sure that your cyber and your IT people know not only about the trends that I've described, which they clearly do, but what the kinds of cybersecurity capabilities that they can bring to bear to leverage those trends are. The, the, the biggest weakness that I find is in procurement. And Mark said in his introduction, virtually every government service out there now has a digital component. Building roads and bridges now has a digital dimension because they all have sensors in them. The people who let those contracts know how to evaluate good vendors from bad vendors in terms of do they have the resources to deliver this project on time, they're almost certainly not experts in how should I secure those sensors. Well, guess what? There are other people in government at other levels of government in other governments who have done those. Don't reinvent the wheel. Cybersecurity is really important. You've got a lot of infrastructure dollars flowing into refreshing all of the kinds of infrastructure you have. But if you don't think about cybersecurity at the front end, you're making super highways for threat actors to move from highways to water to power, and you won't be able to see them do it, and you won't be able to collectively mitigate them. This is something that's relatively easy to address in the specifications for contracts. I want sensors to do this, I want controls to do that, and you don't even have to figure it out yourself. You've got other organizations that have done it, but if you don't if you don't think about it, you're going to end up in the same situation we were in, in after 9-11 when a lot of money got thrown at first responders to buy new capabilities and left to their own devices. People did things like buy radios that were on different frequencies and find out that when they had a multi-jurisdictional problem, they couldn't talk to each other. Let's avoid doing that on procurement of cybersecurity capabilities and leadership. Inevitably, you're going to have a problem. You're going to be breached. And this is something where having the dialogue with senior leadership, with the executives in your organization, with the council, with whoever, about how you're going to respond is important. This doesn't have to be a terribly complicated activity involving computers and role playing game, but literally a 30 minute tabletop where you say, OK, if this has happened, how are we going to respond? Who are we going to notify? Uh, what do we say to the public? What do we say to our stakeholders? Where do we get outside counsel? Because increasingly people want to lawyer up in dealing with these. This is something where you really have to start this conversation, at the top of the organization, and then put together a playbook for how the organization is going to respond. Final slide, please. You've got a lot of resources there in the state. Uh, you've got nationwide assets that are actually located in the state. Center for Internet Security, uh, which houses two of the things that are called Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, or ISACs, which are ways of pulling data together, and even more importantly, from my perspective, having human analysts to make sense of it and send out information tailored to that kind of organization. The one for states, which also includes local government, and for election integrity are part of the Center for Internet Security, which is right there in Albany. Yes, it's a nationwide asset, that, but it, it's part of your home team. Take advantage of that. Uh, clearly, you're all familiar with the Joint uh, Security Operations Center, the JSOC, which is providing both tools and that kind of intelligence. At the federal level, CISA, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, has got multiple advisors who provide both cyber services and other homeland security services right there in the state. Uh, one of the most important things I could do is say, make contact with your local FBI field office. There are three FBI field offices in New York, one in New York City, one in Albany, one in Buffalo. Figure out which one uh, your jurisdiction should work with. Every one of those field offices, like the rest of the other 53 across the country, has cyber experts, people whose full-time job is to deal with cybersecurity. Figure out who they are, have an con introductory call with those people before you've been breached. They can tell you best practices. There's a program called InfraGuard that gets where, where jurisdictions, organizations, private sector get together quarterly to hear about threats, to hear about, about best practices. You don't want your first contact with the FBI to be when you've been breached 
and you have to figure out what to do about it. You can go there. Absolutely, you can do that. But I think they would tell you they would love to talk to you in advance uh, to just lay the groundwork so that they can better help you uh, and talk to industry. Talk to people in industry about what the art of the possible is. They can help you say, OK, based on your responsibilities, your resources, the technology roadmap you have, here's how you can bake cybersecurity into that. And the final piece of advice I give you is network. What I tell everybody is find a trusted advisor, whether it's a blog, somebody who says things that make sense, whether it's a peer, whether it's somebody in industry who you trust is not trying to sell you something, but is trying to help you come to a, a good position in terms of securing you know, the, uh, the assets you have and the services you need to provide. But, but recognize you're not out there alone. This is complex, this is overwhelming, but genuinely there are people who recognize that the public sector is a critically important part of critical infrastructure and want to help you provide and secure government services. So next and final. With that, Mark, um, I'm hoping that you've got some questions for me because I tried to leave time to answer them. Yes, I appreciate it, Jim. This is a great presentation. I have a handful of questions and uh, because the dashboard has changed a little bit in our GoToWebinar, I'm encouraging folks to send us their questions and we will get them answered as soon as we can. Uh, but I do have a list of questions. So whether I'm in, a, in, in an executive or an administrator's office in a county government or I'm the IT director or part of the IT staff, who should I be talking to about improving my security, our security posture? So um, I think my resources slide really touched on a lot of this stuff. Um, if your jurisdiction is not part of MSISAC, and it probably is, um, I would certainly look to them. They have, uh, they even have a marketplace of tools, and they have uh, a set of security controls at the Center for Internet Security, 20 controls that you should implement. So that's an easy way to do it. Certainly the JSOC is an in-state asset. They may be able to give you some actual devices that can help with security, especially at the with those endpoint devices, uh, give you sources of intelligence as well. Uh, you know, the, the CISA people um, have got a staff who can come around and actually help you diagnose where you are and where you want to be from a security perspective. I've already said, talk to the FBI, uh, you know, because they, again, can help you figure out when, how can you better harden your organization, but also if something bad happens, how can you help them help you? A lot of us, and then people like me. I mean, I'm not here to sell you an answer. I'm, I'm here to help you be more secure because, you know, after three plus decades in, in government, I, I still want to help the public sector. And, and we appreciate that. We appreciate your leadership and your experience in sharing that with us today. What is your perspective on cyber insurance? Most of our counties have some form of cyber cyber insurance, but others others are are you know sitting on the sidelines at a wait and see kind of thing. So, what do you recommend in terms of cybersecurity insurance for county governments? So, you know, uh, well, I, cyber insurance is a good news bad news story. I mean, in the sense that it is good because to get coverage, they're going to levy a set of a set of requirements that you have to do, uh, which can actually make sure that you're doing best practices, that you're implementing the right kinds of technology. Something that most people don't think of from as a, a benefit of insurance, and you really should should ask your current or prospective insurer if they do this. Is I've, you've heard me talk about cyber threat intelligence as being really important. Insurance in the insurance industry is a really good source of cyber threat intelligence. You talk about people who are at the pointy end of the spear. They see every week what is working uh, and they have skin in the game of wanting to have you avoid getting victimized and file a claim against them. So if your insurer is not making cyber threat intelligence, actionable cyber threat intelligence of ways you can defend your network available to you, ask them why not. And if they don't do it, look for a different one. The bad news about cyber insurance is just because you haven't doesn't mean you're not still ultimately responsible for the network and for operations. It's like car insurance. We all have to have it, but you, the motorist, are still responsible for driving securely and for behaving appropriately. So sometimes I find organizations that say, I have cyber insurance. I've solved cyber risk. 
No, you haven't. You've transferred some of the risk to a third party. But guess what? If you're then negligent about not doing the basics, they may tell you they're not going to pay out. The other challenge I've seen about cyber insurance is sometimes it makes you an attractive target. And I saw this uh, especially a number of years ago where uh, small governments, you know, towns and villages were getting victimized in part because they were going to be an easy payout. When you, you're, what you spend money on is usually a matter of public record. Potential cyber criminals look for that. They look for it and go, oh, look, this township has a policy with Acme Insurance Company. They pay this much. They're probably covered against that much. So they hit you with ransomware and they ask for the amount in Bitcoin that just happens to coincide with your coverage because they know that when you file the claim, the professionals at the insurance company are going to step in. They're going to negotiate the settlement. So on balance, you need cyber insurance, but you have to recognize it doesn't solve all of your problems. But it's a, it's a tool in the tool chest and it's a partner in the alliance working with you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, in terms of generative AI, I know you spoke a little bit about this, but I'm going to prod a little bit here. Um, is generative AI going to solve my problems or make new ones or a combination of those? It, I mean, the answer is, is door number three. It's, it's a combination of them. Uh, you know, I think right now, and I, I alluded to this already, I think or, most organizations are taking a very deliberative approach to rolling out generative, generative AI. The problem is, in most cases, they haven't communicated that to the workforce. These are the same people who are using all of these tools at home. They're seeing it, you know, do spell correct for them automatically. There's, it, there's, you know, they're seeing it used in every other facet of their life, and they're going, "Wow, I, why don't I use this at work as well?" And some of them are doing it. Uh, so I, you know, even just telling people, "Look, you understand why we don't expose uh, personal identifying information and sensitive citizen data. Uh, don't put anything in a prompt that you wouldn't put in an email that you were sending outside the organization to an external audience." Education is part of this, uh, but I think generative AI certainly is going to help us. Uh, but as I said, when I laid out the rubric of when not to use it, um, I'm, I'm more optimistic that it's going to help us on the IT side, on being able to make correlations and, and uh, allow us to do some things with information that are not necessarily on OT. Because again, if I look at it and say, I have to have perfection, I have to have, you know, uh, real time. Those are things that start to fly in the face of the, what I laid out as the priorities for OT, like safety and reliability. So it'll help on OT. I think it's easier to see how it helps us in the office, in the workplace of information technology. So, so many of us have to, to um, make budget proposals and, and justify expenditures. Do you have any recommendations for how we can demonstrate the value of cybersecurity to our governments? So this is where we come down to somebody who spent a lot of time in governments. Um, I say we have carrots and sticks. And a lot of times you can say, I have to do the following, or these are best practices. I'm negligent if I don't do these things. Measuring the return on cyber investment is always a little bit tricky uh, because you know, cyber is usually viewed as an overhead, something I have to do, something that doesn't bring resources in. So if you can say, OK, here are the here are I'm implementing zero trust. Here are the practices. Here are the things that I need to do. We get further in cybersecurity uh, when we leverage something that uh, we call convergence between um, between networking and security, which is increasingly we talk about I wanted to connect my users, my devices my data and my resources, because this enables me to do things. But gosh, of course, I've got to do this in a secure fashion. We saw this with the pivot from COVID. People started working from home. Productivity, you know, we were able to keep them connected. And then all of a sudden we discovered we were getting compromised coming through people's home environments. So saying, all right, I am enabling new things to happen, to be done. I can give you the positive outcome of that. And yes, I need it to be secure. So you just have to accept doing it in a secure fashion is the cost of providing that service. Thank you. And that's all the questions that I have at this, po uh, at this point. But I, again, I encourage our audience to submit those questions and we will get them over to Jim uh, at, the, at the end of this webinar. Uh, Jim, any, any last minute uh, do, you know, uh, thoughts before we end this webinar? 
So, you know, you, you again, as I said, you in New York, I think, are in a, a relatively, you're in a privileged position in terms of the assets you have. Um, and, and even at the federal level, you're one of the places where the federal government recognizes you are a place that, that deserves priority. All, all states need, need, need love and need protection. But clearly, when people look at the kinds of activities and assets that you have in New York, you're something where you've got people who are are on your side, both in government and in the private sector. So, you know, I've described, I've touched on a lot in this webinar. I'm not trying to give you all the answers, but this is a, this is a truism, and I talked about this in my uh, recent congressional testimony, cybersecurity is a team sport. And there are a lot of people who are playing on your team who really want to help you uh, do it the right way and succeed. Jim, on behalf of the New York State Association of Counties, our attendees today, and all of our members of the association, I want to thank you for lending your time and expertise with us today. Cybersecurity, as you just mentioned, cybersecurity is a team effort, and we appreciate your leadership in our collective endeavor to protect our governments and the New Yorkers we serve. We thank our attendees for joining us and helping to keep our systems and data safe. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar and slide deck are being posted on the NISAC website at www.nisac.org backslash webinar. We encourage you to share this webinar recording with your colleagues. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. So are we off? We're not off. I'm going to leave. Thank you, Jim, very much. Get up.